blessing. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity that that pastor has given me tonight, and I appreciate you being here. You know, sometimes when it's announced that you're going to preach, it's a scary thing because you never know who's who may say, "Oh, really? <laughs> maybe I'll just stay home." But um, maybe someone did. I don't know. But I'm glad that you came. And for those of you watching online, thank you for tuning in tonight. Um, I don't propose to be an expert on trials, nor do I say that I am going through my current trial uh, flawlessly by any way, uh, but I have learned some things in my life. I, I told somebody this week that the pastors asked me to preach on trials. They asked the old guy to preach on trials. You know, when you've got a young pastor and a young assistant pastor, I guess the 53-year-old old, old timer um, has a little bit more life experience uh, in some of these things. And um, the biggest trial of my life, obviously, is the one that began four years ago. I say began because it's not really over. Um, every time I hear saturation Saturday, I think, boy, I wish I could walk just that little bit better, go up and down steps. I could, I'd love to participate in that at this point. My participation is, is praying for you when you go out, uh, which I do on the Saturdays that I know that you're going out. I, I'm in prayer for uh, those who are able to go. Talking about Brother Clayton, I um, asked him a couple weeks ago how he was feeling, and he'd gotten a good report from the cardiologist. He'd just come home. He said, I got a good report, but I feel like I've been hit by a Mack truck. So I said, well, it's pretty invasive surgery. You know, I mean, open heart surgery, obviously. Um, so I asked him a week or two ago, I said, are you, are you feeling less like you were hit by a Mack truck? He said, yeah, now I feel like I've been hit by a motorcycle. So I guess that's a step in the right direction, but uh, I don't think I want to be hit by either one. Um, I can do enough damage to myself, let alone uh, being hit by somebody. But you know, you know what he's saying, that's the expression, feel like I've been hit by a Mack truck. Sometimes you feel like that when you have, a, have the flu or something too, but... Uh, um, definitely appreciated his friendship over the years and his vision for Kitchener and Canada and the surrounding area. It was really through, through him that I became, uh, I ended up going to Cambridge. Obviously, it was because it was through the church, but for several years, he'd always said, we should, we should start a church in Cambridge. And I was the assistant pastor at the time, and I, I, I said, yeah, that's right, somebody should come and do that. And one day, in 20, 2002, God put his finger on my heart and said, you're, you're the one. So that's how Beacon Baptist Church in Cambridge got started through a, a series of events. Um, and praise the Lord for that. Um, well, yeah, four years ago today, I was transferred from Grand River Hospital Main Site, downtown Kitchener, to Grand River Hospital Freeport location for rehab. At that point, I could not stand up. I tell you that because I specifically remembered not long before I was transferred, my therapist at the Grand River Main site, it took two, two young ladies had me standing up, and I, I said something to, to my nurse that was looking after me, and she, or she said, oh, she said, your, your two therapists were crying today because they had you standing up. I said, why would they st cry about having someone stand up? Well, the doctor told my wife I would never stand up and never walk, and I would be incontinent, wheelchair bound, drooling uncontrollably in a wheelchair um, in a nursing home for the rest of my life. They said, if, would he wanted to save his life if that's what his life would be? And she said, yes. So here we are a little over four years later. And uh, like I said, those, those two young ladies were, were crying that they actually had me able to stand up. And I don't think I stood up again till probably a couple of weeks into May, I know I have a picture of me standing up at some parallel bars with, with a physiotherapist on either side of me who would helped me to stand up at this bar because I still was unable to, uh, to stand up. But I won't spend too long on my testimony tonight for fear of taking too much time. Take your Bible and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Most of the uh, thoughts of the message are found here in our text. I'm glad to share with you uh, things of my life, but things of my life are limited help. The Bible is unlimited help. God is unlimited in his help. So it's not what I have done and what I have tried physically, it's what God says in his word that makes the difference. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 
Um, he says, therefore, seeing we have received, uh, seeing we have this ministry, as we received mercy, we faint not. And that's an important statement. It's repeated twice, actually, in the, in the uh, chapter, we faint not. Verse 2, but we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience and the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest, made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We have the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken, we also believe, and therefore we speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. The things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you uh, for your word. Lord, thank you for the privilege that uh, you've given me this, this evening to stand here in this pulpit to preach your word. Lord, I pray that it would be the principles of your word that will, will be the focus of our hearts and our attention tonight. Give me strength, Lord. I just said that I wasn't able to stand up four years ago, and I'm thankful I'm able to stand here tonight to preach. But, Lord, you know this treasure of the gospel and the word of God is in this earthen vessel that is a cracked, broken vessel. I need your strength physically, but more importantly, Lord, I need your strength spiritually to communicate the truths that will help us in our life. So, Lord, use your word in our lives tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may want to uh, focus on four main points um, in the message this evening about lessons learned about trials in my life from the Word of God. The first one is, is not stated clearly in our text, but I would like us to think about permission, the permission of trials. Verse 10 does say... Um, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our body. And verse 11 says, for Jesus' sake. Now that's not a clear statement of the permission of trials by any stretch of the imagination. I do think it, it reflects the fact that Paul recognized that those things he talked about being uh, you know, in despair but not uh, being troubled but not distressed, being perplexed but not in despair, I think you recognize that God had allowed those things in the course of his ministry. But obviously the thought of permission is seen more clearly in Paul's thorn in the flesh, um, as Pastor preached about um, in his message in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Yes, the thorn in the flesh was the messenger of Satan, but God clearly allowed that for his purpose. And that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Again, very clearly, permission for trials is seen in the life of Job, clearer than anybody else in the scripture, because very clearly God tells the devil, I will let you go this far and no further in each situation. So God allows trials in our life. 
Though difficulties come on everyone because of our sin-cursed world, it is important to note that Christians are protected from many things, and many of the trials we do face are permitted by our loving, gracious, purposeful God. This is in keeping with being a peculiar people, as Pastor preached uh, last week, who are encircled by God, so everything that comes to us has to come through God first. I appreciate Pastor's uh, comment that he often makes, that the things we face are Father filtered. filtered. God allows things in our life. Early in my recovery, I was in Freeport Hospital, it was probably in, in May of 2018, I woke up one morning, um, and God just, I, I say randomly, because to me it was randomly, obviously it wasn't randomly to God, brought John 11.37 to my mind. John 11.37 says this, And some of them said, Could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? The story is Lazarus. John chapter 11 is the story of Lazarus, and you may remember at the beginning of the chapter, Martha and Mary sent to bring Jesus to heal Lazarus because he was sick. And the Bible says that Jesus, when he heard that, abode two days where he was. And he said, made the statement that this sickness is not unto death, but to the glory of God. And so, when Jesus came to Lazarus, and he'd already, he was already dead, and that famous verse, the shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept. The people who knew that Jesus knew Lazarus and probably knew that Mary and Martha had sent for Jesus when Lazarus was alive but sick, then they are the ones that said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? They looked and said, hey, why didn't, I, why didn't this Jesus do something for his friend Lazarus? Well, Jesus had already told the disciples this, this was for the glory of God. He had a purpose. In this, but he had permitted Lazarus to die. That, that thought, when that came to me in John eleven thirty seven, I had preached through the Gospel of John um, as pastoring the church, but I don't remember ever thinking about that verse particularly, but that morning, it was just like it, it came to my mind, and God was saying, I allowed this, trust me. Uh, so permission, the permission of trials. It's important to recognize, as pastors pointed out, uh, last week, that God allows things in our life. Everything is Father filtered. So, lessons learned about trials, permission. But then, purpose. I referred, inferred that already, but Jesus said there was a purpose in allowing Lazarus to die. There was a, there's a purpose in trials. We read verses 10 to 15, and I'd like to think about some of these things. Now, we could generally say that God's purpose for difficulties in our life is summed up in, in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29, where we reminded that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Verse, that's 28. Verse 29 says that, that our, God's purpose for us is to be conformed to the image of his Son. Trials bring us through that process and towards that goal of being conformed to the image of of Christ. But there are a few specific purposes seen in our text I'd like to just touch on briefly this evening. Um, the first one being in verse number 10, which speaks about the furtherance of the gospel. At the end of verse 10, it says that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Christian, that remind you tonight, remind you that people are watching your life. And they are particularly watching your life when you face a trial and a difficulty. Trials and difficulties become witnessing opportunities which may help to open the eyes of those who have been blinded by Satan, as verse 4 told us. Paul said in Philippians 1, verse 12, remember Paul got imprisoned. You think of a ministry being taken, um, someone being taken off the ministry trail of church planting Paul, you think, why would God allow that to happen? But he was in prison, and what did he say? I would that you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So the purpose in trial can be the furtherance of the gospel. Sometimes seeing God's work in our life through a trial emboldens our witness. 
for the Lord. I remember my brother telling me, my brother Richard telling me that at an early point in my recovery when some miracles would take place, I wasn't expected really to live at all. The bright side was what I explained to you about being wheelchair bound, living in a nursing home, drooling, uh, being incontinent. That was the bright side. The other side of the coin, the doctors were, if he survives, this will be what his purpose will be. So God brought me through some situation. I was in a coma, uh, uh, one, one purposeful coma to let my brain rest, and then also some aspects of coma that were just a result of the stroke. But I remember my brother telling me that he had talked to a, another worker at a building site that he was on, and he, he felt more emboldened to witness to this man because he'd seen and heard what God was doing in my life. And it wasn't my brother didn't believe. My brother is, is the one who led me to the Lord. He knew what God was capable of. He knew what God could do in saving people. But just seeing a miracle that God did in my life gave him more boldness to say, this is my God and let me tell you about him. And he was able then to, to share the gospel uh, more and just, just brag on God a little bit um, with somebody. It was, he was emboldened in that. Um, our trials may also bring us into the lives of other people or bring people into our lives we wouldn't have met otherwise. My dad spent the last 10 years of his life battling and ultimately succumbing to Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS. My dad ended up getting a mobility scooter. Um, my mom has always been a dog lover so she always had a dog in the house and walked the dog so my dad would ride his scooter and my mom would go along and walk the dog. They'd go down to the park in Burlington, Spencer Smith Park is on the lake. And they would often go down in my dad's mobility scooter basket, as they typically do on the front. I have one now myself, there's a basket. In there he had an old uh, margarine, empty margarine container. I say empty, it wasn't empty, it was actually full of gospel tracts. You can imagine that my, my parents drew some attention, you know, a, a couple Husband in a, in a mobility scooter, wife walking a dog, they drew some attention. They weren't old. I, my dad started with, with uh, ALS when he was about 50 years old and passed away when he was just 60 or 61, but they drew attention. And when people would come over to talk, my dad was unable to reach in and take a tract and give it to people. He, his hands were not working very well at all, sort of like my left side is now, but uh, I, I can remember seeing him, because sometimes we would be with him, kind of pointing with, it, with his head, can you, can you take one of those? And he was asking people to take a tract. Uh, he was using the opportunity of people coming into his life to give them the gospel. And so God may bring, or trials may bring people into our lives we wouldn't have met otherwise. My stroke has given me opportunities to witness of God's power, grace, and salvation to Numerous people, when I was in Freeport Hospital, my occupational therapist, knowing that I was a pastor, one of the occupational things that they, you know, they want you to be able to get back to what you did, so they knew I was a pastor, so she said, can you prepare a sermon and preach it to me? So I had the opportunity to preach a sermon to my occupational therapist. I had the opportunity to ask her if she knew the Lord, and she said she did. I was, I was grateful for that, but that was an opportunity I wouldn't have had to talk to her otherwise. I wouldn't have met her any other way, but she gave me an opportunity to preach. It was unusual, sat down at across the table from somebody to preach a sermon, but that was uh, an opportunity that God gave me. Uh, since then, I've had different people in my life, uh, um, personal support workers and so on, and everyone that has come to see me, I've made a point of at least giving them a gospel tract and giving them just a little bit of my testimony to just brag on God. Yesterday I went for a haircut. You may, have, you may or may not have noticed. Um, just more, more of the beach showing and less of the wave. But anyway, um, the, the barber uh, was cutting my hair and of course, you know, I walked in with my cane, I pulled up on my mobility scooter, so I've been there a few times. They, they know a little bit about me. They know I've had a stroke. But she said they, they must have done quite an extensive surgery because she could see the scar on my scalp which basically because they had to take almost the whole right side of my skull off, so they, they had to cut a big piece of 
obviously I had to cut my scalp open, but I said, I said, yes, she said, you're doing very well. How, how come you're doing so well? I, th I told her just briefly that I wasn't expected to walk or stand up again, so she said, how are you doing so well? So I said, well, I said, I'm a Christian and I believe that God has a lot to do with how I'm doing. I said, I've, I've been persistent, it's taken a lot of work, but ultimately it's because, because of God. You know, we have opportunities in trials to, to brag on God. We may, we may or may not have opportunity to give the full gospel, but if we can just tell people, hey, there's a God, he's real. Look what he's done in my life. I can tell you what he's been doing since I was 12 years old, but I can also tell you what he's been doing physically over these last few years of my life. And so God may bring other people into our life through the trial that he brings us to and brings us through so the furtherance of the gospel is a purpose and trial we see in our text here, which is included in, but also I'd like us to consider it as a point by itself, bringing glory to God. Bringing glory to God. Verse 15, it says, For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. The glory of God. As people see the supernatural grace and strength given to those going through trials, it glorifies God. Many people, as I've told them about my prognosis that I wasn't expected to walk or stand, often it's neighbors when I've been walking. I go for a walk every day around our street. And uh, so different people will say things, have said things over the last couple of years at this particular house where we live now. And... Um, I say what the, what the doctor said about me, and they say, well, you're really showing them, aren't you? And I say, well, it's, it's hard, but it's God. It's God that's given me the ability to do that. I, I like to deflect the glory to God. I want, I want people patting me on the back. I better not try patting myself on the back or I'll fall on the floor. <laughs> but... Um, you know, I want, I want people to know who, who the glory belongs to. It belongs to God. And uh, what a blessing it is to be able to, to give glory to the one whom, to whom glory is due. One time I was on a um, virtual uh, meeting for our stroke group, I think it was, and the lady who ran it was talking about, you know, I think I said I had been preaching and different things. And, and again, the comment, well, you're doing really well. And so I said, well, I've had supernatural help. And her comment was, oh, come on, Chris, take credit where credit is due. And I said, I am giving credit where credit is due. Credit is due to God. And I believe that our trials can bring glory to God. One of my um, people at the YMCA who directs our exercise over Zoom, or he used to, he's not there anymore. But again, you know, it comes up in conversation. I've been preaching or different things like that. And I try and you know, put in some word, brag on God a little bit, and his comment was this, well, Chris, you seem to have a strength that's greater than your own. I do. It's God. And I, I like to try and bring glory to God because I think that's what God allows trials for. That's what he says right here, that may redound to the glory of God. So the purpose in trials, we, we see purpose of furthering the gospel of bringing glory and of bringing glory to God, but also of helping others through their trials. Verse 12, he says, So then death worketh in us, but life in you. Paul said, You've been benefited by the things that we've been going through. You know, through your experiences of dealing with a trial, you can help other people uh, deal with their trials and deal with their situations. Somebody said it this way, how you make it through your troubles will become someone else's roadmap to get through theirs. I had the opportunity to be with Pastor McLean from New Testament Baptist Church in Hamilton. Yesterday, he picked me up to take me to a, a board meeting down in Hamilton, and um, on the journey, he said, I was talking to somebody recently, and a relative of theirs who's seven years old just had a very bad stroke. And he said, I was able to, and, you know, it was very, you know, one side, can't work one side, and a different thing, it's not looking good. But he said, I was able to tell them 
about you, and it really encouraged them. It helped them. Well, that's, that's one of the purposes of our trials. We can help other people through the things that we have experienced. When Jesus said to Peter that Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat, Jesus said, I will pray for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. What was Jesus saying? Peter, you're going to have a purpose. You're going to be able to use what you're going through, this, this sifting process. You're going to be able to use it to help other people in the days to come. Strengthen your brethren. And guess what? He did. Because God used him under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to write First and Second Peter. Well, what do they deal with a lot? Trials. The trial of your faith being much more precious than the gold that perisheth. In First Peter 5, verse 7, you probably know that verse. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Peter learned, Jesus cares for me. He pr was praying for me. He cared for me. And then he said, be sober, be vigilant, because you're the devil as, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking who he may devour. Peter knew what it was like to be chased by the enemy. And so he used his experience to express in scripture, hey, you need to be careful. Be ready. Be on the alert. He probably could have easily said, I wasn't. I was sleeping but you need to be sober and vigilant. 2 Corinthians 1.4, which Pastor McLean actually quoted this to me when he told me about telling the family, says this, who comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. See, we receive comfort in trials, then we turn around with that comfort and we say, hey, this is what God did for me. And we help people with the comfort of God in their life. And so we, we realize the fact is that we can help others through our trials. One of the purposes of our trials. And then the last purpose of our trial we want to see here this evening, verse 17, is earning eternal rewards. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. James says in James 1.12, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, he shall receive the crown of life. Paul says, You receive, it worketh for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. I'm always amazed that the great God who gave us a wonderful, free, eternal salvation for free says, hey, if you, if you serve me and honor me, I will reward you. What a gracious God we serve. But trials are purposeful then in spreading the gospel, bringing glory to God, and earning eternal rewards as well as helping others through their trials. So we've seen the permission, we've seen the purpose, but thirdly, we see also the perseverance. Okay, so trials are permitted and purposeful, but they can be undoubtedly difficult. So just how do we get through them? Isn't that at the end of the day what we want to know? How do I get through this? How do I deal with this trial in my life? How can I persevere in trials? How can I be the one who, like James says, endureth temptation or survives through it, endures through it? Well, God gives us the answer to that question as well in our text um, here in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, as we've read. Firstly, by faith, by faith. Verse 13 says, We have the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore we speak. Believing that the God who made me, saved me, and loved me, permitted this trial that takes faith but that's what we need is that faith that hey God made me from nothing he said I'm fearfully and wonderfully made he saved my soul he loves me more than he loved his own life and he permitted this trial I need to have faith in that to get through the trial that I am facing not only believing about that but also believing that God's purpose in that trial I have a sign over my desk. One of my wife's uh, family friends brought it to me uh, after my stroke, sometime the summer after my stroke. Um, it says this, faith doesn't make things easy, it makes them possible. 
It doesn't make things easy, it makes them possible. We, we can persevere in trials by faith, and then secondly, one day at a time. One day at a time, verse 16, says, for this, for this cause we, which cause we faint not, so that's, he's persevering, Why, how? Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Day by day, one day at a time. We can persevere in trials as we trust God and live our life one day at a time, one step at a time. Trials become most overwhelming when we start thinking of how long they've been and how long they're going to last. It's been four years. I never expected four years ago that I would, would have trouble standing up and have to have a cane a little bit and wouldn't be able to drive and do all kinds of different things. I never expected that that would be the way it would be after four years. I remember my physiotherapist at the Freeport Hospital telling me that her uncle, who had had a stroke, had just recently hugged his wife with both his arms for the first time in two years. And I thought, well, that won't be me. I'm not going to have to wait two years before I can hug my wife with both arms. Guess what? I'm still waiting after four. I could look and say, it's been four years. How much longer? How much longer will I ever be able to use this arm properly? Or I can say, I can make it through today. The inward man is renewed day by day. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The steps of a good man. One day at a time, by a close walk with God. By a close walk with God. By faith, by taking life one day at a time. By a close walk with God. Daily Bible reading and daily prayer undoubtedly are what Paul's talking about here that renew the inner man day by day. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. There's prayer. I'm having a tough day. Cast it on the Lord. I think I can make it. I can think I can manage. I don't want to let God know I'm having a hard time. Guess what? He knows already. Cast your care upon the Lord. Keep a close walk with God. Open his word and let him ask him to give you something. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Psalm 119 verse 18. The inward man is renewed day by day as we trust, depend on, and fellowship with God each day. We sang it, didn't we, tonight? I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. And it's so true. Every hour. Funny story with that song. It always reminds me. I can never forget. My dad always liked to sing, even before he became a Christian. He's always uh, liked, to, liked to sing. And I remember him singing that song after he became a Christian. We had an auto body shop and furniture refinishing business. And I remember hearing him in the spray booth spraying, I don't know if it was a car or some furniture, there was no door on the one, one spray booth that we had, and I remember hearing him saying, I need thee, oh I need thee, oh, oh my darling, I need thee. <laughs> he got, got his old, old music mixed with his new music, but you know, the reality is we need the Lord every, every moment of every day. If we want to renew our inward man, and we're going through a trial, that's especially, we need God every day, enjoy our pain, that's what the song said. So, Good days and bad, we need the Lord every day but and every moment. But our inner man is renewed day by day, and that's what we need more than anything in the midst of a trial. I go for a walk every day around our court, and every day when I go for a walk, I pray and meditate on the scriptures. I pray through and meditate on scriptures, often scriptures that deal with walking, just because they seem very fitting to me as I'm le- relearning how to walk. Again, again, Psalm 37, 23 is one that I, I pray about as I'm walking. Lord, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. I need you to order my steps today, Lord. I need you to give me strength to keep taking these steps. Isaiah 40, 31, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. There are days I, I think, man, I'm tired today. I don't know whether I'm going to make it back around the court to get home. You know what I do? I say, Lord, you said that if I wait upon you, you'll renew my strength. I need you to renew my strength to take another step, another step, another step until I get back back home. You know what happens? I think I just need a, a st- strength for another step. Before I know it, I've walked probably a hundred steps. I think, well, how did I get here already? I could hardly make another step way back there. Well, 
I said, God, I'm waiting on you for the strength for another step. I need you to renew my strength. I don't need the wings as eagles right now. I just need the, you know, the walk and not faint. I don't even not, not even up to the run and not be weary. I just need the walk and not faint. But you know, I, I pray on these things. I walk and, and and talk with the Lord. Pray and meditate. Pray through and meditate on these scriptures. Another one that I always refer to when I'm walking is Jude verse 24. Unto him that is able to keep you from falling. I don't want to fall when I'm walking. Today especially, I thought, I'm going for a walk. Boy, if I fall flat on my face and have to phone pastor and say, sorry, pastor, I've got a broken nose. I'm in hospital. I can't speak tonight. I'm going through another trial related to the other trial that was supposed to be part of the message tonight. But, you know, I, I say, Lord, please keep me from falling. I also think of the verse that says, the just man falls seven times and rises up again. But I say, Lord, I don't want to fall seven times. I want you to keep me from falling, please. So renew my strength and keep me from falling. But you know, as I say that, I say, God, keep me from falling, not only physically right now, but keep me from falling spiritually. Keep me from falling morally. Keep me from falling mentally. God, keep me from falling. Keep me on, my, on, the, on the straight and narrow. Keep me on my feet. Why? Because I know that I need God. I need that close walk with God to get through this trial every day, one day at a time. And of course, coupled with all this, how we get through the trial is God's grace. God's grace, verse 15, says, For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. The abundant grace. I'm glad that God's grace is not skimpy. God's grace is abundant. Without God's grace, I can tell you two things. I would be lost because the grace of God bringeth salvation. So without God's grace, I would be lost but I would also be in a desperate state in my life, particularly in my trials, and particularly in this last four years of, of trials. What does it tell us in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, when Paul asked the Lord to remove the thorn in the flesh, what was Jesus' reply? My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities at the power of Christ may rest upon me. By the way, that glorying in infirmities, Paul wasn't glorying saying, hey man, I've been stoned and left for dead, how about you? What, what, kind of, what kind of infirmities have you faced? Look at me, look at my infirmities. I'm a member of a stroke group on, on Facebook and often people post things, that shirts that they got or tattoos they got. Some of them say things, nice try stroke, but I'm still here. Or I'm a, I'm a stroke survivor, what's your excuse? Hey, listen, let me tell you, I don't think when Paul said, I'm glorying in my infirmities, he was bragging about the things he'd been through. I think what he was saying is, I'll glory in the fact that God's helped me through those infirmities because of his grace. Without God's grace, we can easily become bitter in life, especially in our trials. Robert said in his message that trials can make us better or bitter. You know what makes the difference? The grace of God. Say, how do you know that? Well, our verse from a few months ago, looking diligent, Hebrews 12, 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. The grace of God keeps us from bitterness. So we need the grace of God, and God's grace is abundant even amidst trials. We can persevere in trials by faith, one day at a time, having a close walk with God, being recipients of his grace. And finally, tonight is perspective. Verse 18. Verse 18 says, well, we look not at the things which are seen. That's a continued sentence, by the way, because in verse um, 16 and 17, he's talking about not fainting and Verse 17, it's a light affliction. It's light while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. The things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Perspective could easily be included in the perseverance part of the, the message tonight, but I put it in a, in a section by itself. Perspective of trials. We must follow the example of our Savior and look beyond the temporal to the eternal. 
Jesus said in Hebrews, or it says of Jesus in Hebrews 12 too, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus endured the, that cup, the cross, and all it entailed. How? By seeing the result of his sacrifice, our salvation, that's looking to the eternal, but not the things that are seen, the things that are not seen. Life looks a lot different when we view it in, life, in light of eternity, and trials are particularly uh, that way. One day time will be no more. God will wipe away all the tears from the Christian's eyes. And for those who've been faithful in life, and yea, even in trials, he will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. In that wonderful day, our trials will seem as they're described here, light afflictions, but for a moment. I don't recommend that you go to somebody that's facing a heavy trial and say, hey, lighten up. It's just an easy thing, and it's only for a moment. Because they may turn around and slug you in the face, especially if they're not on a day where they're walking with the Lord and have, have the grace of God in their life. They may forget about the turning the other cheek part of things. But, you know, we need to remember the words of the song. Of times the day seems long, our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur and despair. But Christ will soon appear and catch his bride away. All tears forever over in God's eternal day. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small. When we see Christ, so of his dear face, all sorrow will erase, so bravely run the race till we see Christ. We need to have perspective especially in our trials. The trials of life, like the pleasures of sin, are just for a season. People talk about looking at the bigger picture. That's one of those buzz phrases, isn't it, today? You just need to look at the bigger picture. Well, you know what the bigger picture is? The bigger picture is eternity. It's not just life. It's eternal life. A friend of mine told me of an acronym that he had been told about for the word ALIVE, A-L-I-V-E. Always live in view of eternity. ALIVE, always live in view of eternity. My friends, trials can be really hard, but remembering these lessons will help us through them. Permission for you to face your trials came from your loving Heavenly Father, not to destroy you, but to build you. Oh, the devil may have meant them to destroy you. No doubt he did. He wants to sift you as wheat, but, but God says, I will allow it because I will allow it to build you up. Trials are purposeful, and God has supplied the tools required to persevere in trials. Perspective is found when we consider eternity. Now, these lessons are for Christians. If you don't know the Lord, let your trials be what the psalmist said in Psalm 119, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. If, you're, if you don't know the Lord, let your trials cause you to seek him. Becoming a Christian is not just about eternity, it's also about having a supernatural strength in the struggles of life. The abundant life that Jesus promised us begins here, so receive his salvation today. Those are some of the lessons that I have learned.
in the trials. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Wyatt. We appreciate your ministry. And uh, what a wonderful Bible message. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, God is in control through all of it, and we need to look to him. And there's a greater reward in faithfulness than in fainting, and we need to look to the eternal. And also what some people would call a mobility scooter, others call a Tesla, all right? So <laughs> just remember you're driving a Tesla. Let's uh, look at our hymn books. We're going to sing a, a song of benediction tonight, 396, when you find it. Uh, let's stand together. I'll live for him. My life, my love, I give to thee, the Lamb of God who died for me. Let's stand together, 396. <laughs> On the first, my life, my love. for him. 